All information contained in this podcast is general in nature and does not consider your individual circumstances. You should consider the appropriateness of this information with regards to your individual objectives, financial situation and needs. Welcome to Sharing More Than The Sheets, a podcast to help you and your partner make better financial and lifestyle decisions so that you can both focus on the things that you love. I'm your host, Michael Curry, financial planner, green thumb, husband, and just dad. This segment is called Michael's Magic Moment. It's my opportunity to play a little snippet from one of our previous episodes, which resonated with our listeners that I received feedback from, or I felt really had an impact on some people's lives. Hope you enjoy Today we're talking emotional intelligence, and we go back to episode 35, where I'm talking to Amy Jacobson, who is a emotional intelligence and human behavior expert. She talks about the idea of emotional intelligence and understanding the difference between empathy and sympathy. She also discusses the idea of emotional hijack and what that means. And to me, I find this so important. I find it important because we need to understand these things for our personal lives and our work lives. As soon as we can start understanding it and we can understand our personal emotions and those around us, it makes it so much easier to deal with certain situations. It makes it easier to maintain relationships and to strengthen relationships with your family members, with your partner, um, and even with those that you work with. Why is this important and how does it relate to financial life and financial advice, you're probably thinking. Well, if you think about it, in a relationship, if you can communicate better, and if you can understand the stress that the other person's going through um, in a moment of their life or in a part of their day, you're able to work better as a couple. And if you can work better as a couple, you can manage money better as a couple, and you can manage the other parts of your lives better as a couple. And secondly, when it comes to work, If you're able to understand these things, you're able to function better in the workplace, you'll and probably get yourself a much, um, uh, you know, find yourself in a better position that's paying you more. Um, Or in business, you're able to work with others and you're able to relate to others better and take advantage of opportunities that pop up. Because if you have stronger relationships in business and through work, you're not going to enjoy it more. Um, You're not only going to enjoy it more, but you're also going to be ready for opportunity and maybe be given opportunity if those around you enjoy working with you compared to the opposite of you know being you being a person who isn't really enjoyable to be around or someone that is um very stressful to be around where others around you probably won't want to work with you so as soon as you understand others and as soon as we understand these these concepts that Amy discusses in this episode it makes it so much easier to achieve your goals in real life and it helps you understand things better and work with other people better in your personal and work life. So let's go back to one of my favorite snippets in the episode and I encourage you to listen to the whole episode at a later date and to contact me and let me know what you think as well. The brain, as you said before, the brain is a highly complex, complex uh, organ in our body. And even when we look at how many years or how many decades, centuries we've been studying it for, we still don't completely understand how it works and what happens in there. And and out of all of the research that I've done, it, look, the brain and the mind absolutely fascinate me. But what I found more than anything is that the amount of amazing books that are out there and research that we can read about it is very, it's very science related. It's very complex. And while it blows our mind to read it, there was just this gap between how do I now take what I've learned and actually apply it to day to day to my life and, and know how to build it. And, and that's where we've come from, Michael, in the fact that, you know, this book is about helping people to relate it to themselves and emotional intelligence is directly related to any human being and every single thing we do day in, day out is driven by our level of emotional intelligence and our response. Yes. And would you say it's um, in a way it has something to do with uh, empathy um, or sympathy? Yes. So empathy is a core part of emotional intelligence. So basically if, if we have a look at the definition of emotional intelligence, there's five key concepts to it. And and in the past, Daniel Goleman is probably, his definition is probably the most 
common or most well-known definition of emotional intelligence out there. And and he defined it as self-awareness, your self-regulation, empathy, social skills or communication and motivation. So empathy is one of those five key concepts. Now, when I've taken it and simplified it and really turned it into actionable items, I think it's a lot more than just empathy when we look at the people space. And, and that comes into that third area that I refer to in the book is the feel it section. And empathy for me is the greatest skill that anyone can ever build. However, there are so many other things around it that really complement empathy. And that is around those, those leadership skills, those people skills, the ability to empower people, the ability to understand what makes other people tick. And, and I think until we truly understand this, it's very hard to be empathetic. Yeah. And how does it differ to sympathy? Because um, it's, I mean, to, to me, I've always seen them as the same thing, slightly different, but I mean, I've, I've heard you explain this before that there's a very big difference between the two. There is, there is. So a lot of people interchange empathy and sympathy do, and and they get confused to think it is the same thing. Now, the difference between the two of them, sympathy, if we start with sympathy, sympathy is genuinely feeling sorry for somebody. So sympathy, you're looking at the situation, you're looking at the person, you're looking at what they're going through, and you have you have feelings, you, you feel for what they're dealing with or the or what's going on. And even at times we might even have a bit of pity in there. Um, so sympathy is a beautiful thing and it's really being able to, to really put yourself into the situation that that person is going through. Where empathy is completely different. Empathy, you don't even need to know what is happening. You don't need to know what the circumstance is. You don't have to agree with what that person is feeling or how that person is responding. All you're doing with empathy is actually recognizing the emotion that they are feeling. So to give you an example, if we had somebody who is really angry in front of us or on the end of the phone, which I'm sure we all have at at different times, especially in the workplace and around family and friends as well. If we have somebody really angry, we don't need to know what made them angry. Uh, We don't need to agree with their response. Even if we do know what made them angry, we could be looking at them and thinking, you are totally overreacting or I would never respond this way. What empathy is about is really understanding, okay, this person in front of me is angry. It doesn't matter why. It doesn't matter if I agree. I know that they are angry. When was the last time I was that angry or when was the last time I was angry in general? And what is the worst thing that somebody could say to me compared to what is the best thing that somebody can say to me? And look, this isn't rocket science, but unfortunately our brain will naturally try to diffuse a situation. So if somebody is angry, we find that nine times out of 10, the first thing that comes to our mind to say is calm down or take a deep breath. You know, why are you so angry? Um, and really, when we recall the last time we're angry, we know that that is the worst thing. That is the last thing we want to hear when we're angry. So it's really empathy is getting past that worst thing and knowing the best thing to say or do. Yes. And I think that, I mean, I, I mean I'm mean, i just thinking of my wife and I, you know, like, I mean, we've got three children and, you know, we'll have things that happen with the kids or things with work. And I mean, very rarely do, do I know what she's going through, um, you know, especially after that I've come home and I haven't seen her all day. And likewise, very rarely does she know what's happening in my mind, uh, work-wise, for example. So um, that actually makes a lot of sense because it's, I like that you said that you don't actually have to know what the specifics of the situation is just understanding that, how that person may feel or like what you said, remembering the last time that you felt that way. So that, that's um, right. And I think, you know, I've got, my husband and I have got a 14 year old daughter and a 12 year old son. And, and it always reminds me with empathy when, you know, I can come home from a day at work and my husband can as well. And, and our 14 year old daughter, who's in those really challenging years, she can come home from school and say, that was the worst day ever. Like I had a terrible, terrible day and we'll sit down with her and say, okay, what happened? Just say, you know, these friends aren't getting along and they got in an argument or this person doesn't like me or, you know, my maths teacher is terrible and she gave me extra homework. And and naturally in our mind, I know I'm thinking, really? Like, really? Is that the worst day ever? Is that as bad as it gets? But empathy is remembering that I don't need to agree with her. All I need to look and think is is that she's had 
a really troublesome day and in her mind she's struggling she's struggling with how she's feeling and for me to turn around and downplay what she's feeling is not going to help the situation me telling her that you know your teenage years are the best years of your life and school isn't that hard wait until you get to to work until you know the real life part um that's not going to help the situation empathizing is knowing that when someone's in a highly emotional state they have something to say and whether they're angry or excited or fearful or feeling shameful or guilty, whatever it is, they have something to say and they don't want to be shut down or made to feel like they're, the emotion they're feeling is not justified. Yes, yes. And, and, and as far as emotions are concerned, you, you've, um, I've, I've heard you mention this term called emotional hijack. Yes. Um, and if you could sort of touch on that just a little bit because I think that's, again, as a parent and – I guess this even applies in the workplace, but just there's, yeah, I found it fascinating to actually understanding what it is and sort of knowing how I react to certain things. Yeah. So emotional hijack is extremely common. Like this, emotional hijacks happen every single day within all of us and the people around us. And what is basically happening is that when we get information into our brain, it comes in through our five senses. And when that information comes comes in, it goes into a place in our brain called the thalamus, which pretty much converts it into a language that our brain understands. And then it sends it through to an area called the neocortex and the neocortex is where we analyze it. And it's, it's that part of the brain that we really refer to as the logical part of our brain. And it is from this logical part of our brain that we then send this data through to our emotional brain, which is our amygdala. And it then decides how we will emotionally respond in a situation. But with an emotional hijack, what happens is we've got this kind of dotted line between our thalamus and our amygdala. So what happens is when that information comes in, before it even gets a chance to get through to our logical brain, before we even get a chance to analyse it, to think it through, we have an emotional reaction. It jumps straight down to our emotional brain and we start to respond emotionally And this tends to occur when we don't have enough information or we are triggered with something. And these emotional hijacks, as you said, Michael, they happen in work and at home. I'll give you two really easy examples. First off of the workplace, I want you to picture yourself at work and five minutes before you're about to leave for the day, your leader or your manager or your boss or whoever it is comes up to you and says, let's have a chat in the morning and walks away. And at that point, with very little information, not knowing what they want to talk about, the chances of us going home and having a good night's sleep are going to be pretty low because what can happen is our mind goes straight into that emotional hijack thinking, what do they want to speak to me about? Like, have I done something wrong? Like, what was the last thing that I did? Some people might even get to the point where they're thinking, this is it, like I'm getting a promotion. Like, this is all going to happen tomorrow morning. So these emotional hijacks can happen in the workplace. But then if we throw over to outside of the workplace in in real life, you know, the picture for most of us have, have been to the doctor at some stage and had some blood tests done. And, and, you know, you might get a call from the receptionist a couple of days later that says, you know, the doctor wants to see you and discuss your blood test results. And and we try to get the answers out of the receptionist saying, can you, you tell me what they were? No, no, sorry. You'll have to see the doctor about that. And, And in that time between receiving that call and seeing the doctor, we might find ourselves on Google doctor trying to work out what's wrong with this or what's the worst case scenario or or overanalyzing it only to realize that when we actually get in to see the doctor, it might be something quite minor that they just want to monitor. So these emotional hijacks happen in relationships, in workplaces, everywhere around and it is a natural process that happens in our mind when we don't have enough information or we are triggered by something which means we bypass that logical part of our brain and we respond emotionally okay that makes sense that makes a lot of sense because it's and and i think understanding that and and understanding the concept i guess sort of helps us not to overreact to certain situations and helps us to sort of stay I guess, neutral, would you say, or sort of um, open-minded? Yeah. I mean, it's coming down to that self-awareness. I I would say, you know, trying to stop emotional hijacks altogether is 
unrealistic. These things are going to happen. It is the key thing with emotional intelligence is self-awareness. It's that first step of really owning it, of owning what is happening in the situation, owning who you are and owning how you're responding. And the more that we can become aware and understand that things like emotional hijacks actually occur and they're real, then we can become aware when we're going into an emotional hijack, but we can also become really aware when the people around us are going into an emotional hijack. And like you said before, Michael, you know, even just coming home from work into the household where your partner's been at work or they've had, you know, a day very separate to ours, knowing and being aware of those times when we do jump in because the pressures of home life and children and cooking dinner and organising everything at night start to really play in, we see these emotional hijacks happen and and it's a matter of stopping and really acknowledging the fact, okay, I'm in an emotional hijack or my partner's in an emotional hijack. How do we get more information into this or how do we take a deep breath and actually acknowledge the trigger that is occurring so that we can get that information into our logical mind and start thinking about it logically rather than emotionally? Thanks for joining us on Sharing More Than The Sheets. Please make sure you subscribe to be updated with future episode releases and feel free to share this episode with any friends or family that you think it might benefit. Please visit us at sharingmorethanthesheets.com.au to submit questions or requests for future podcast topics. These podcasts have been brought to you by Better Financial Planning Australia. To book a 15-minute phone chat, visit betterfinancialplanning.com.au.